Good evening. I'm Matt Jaffe. I'm the Interim Executive Director at the IOP. And uh, we are honored to welcome David Litt uh, here today to discuss his new book, Thanks Obama, My Hopey, Changey Years in the White House. Uh, he is a former speechwriter for President Obama and is now the head writer and producer of Funny or Die in Washington, D.C. Um, I want to let you all know that copies of this book are for sale in the hallway, and following the event, David will be out there signing them. Uh, before we start, a couple plugs for some upcoming IOP events. We have Leah Greenberg, who's the co-founder of Indivisible. She will be uh, here on October 3rd discussing resisting the Trump agenda. Then on October 10th, the chair of the Republican National Committee, Ronna McDaniel, will be talking about the future of the GOP, along with IOP fellow Karen Tumulty. You can register for these events at our website, politics.uchicago.edu. Um, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, for those of you who have attended IOP events before, you already know this, but um, at, the, uh, at the second half of today's event, we will take audience questions. Um, and at that time, if you'd like to ask a question, please line up in the center aisle. And as always, we will give priority to student questions. Now, here to formally introduce uh, our speaker tonight is George Adames. George is from Augusta, Georgia, and has interned not once, but twice at the State Department. And uh, he also is getting two degrees in five years here. Not too bad. Um, George most recently interned this past summer at the State Department in Barcelona. So now, please join me in welcoming George to the podium. Good evening, everyone. I'm honored to introduce America's former comedian in chief this evening. <laughs> Comedy plays an undeniable role in our society and in our politics. Just last week, we saw television host Jimmy Kimmel transform the debate around the latest Republican effort to repeal Obamacare through jokes and witty dialogue. And very few individuals are more well equipped to discuss the role of comedy than Mr. David Litt. David Litt attended Yale University, where he was a member of an improv group and editor-in-chief of the Yale Record, the oldest humor magazine in the world. In 2011, he began working at the White House as a senior presidential speechwriter for presidential advisor Valerie Jarrett, White House Chief of Staff William Daley, and even President Barack Obama himself. In this role, Litt was a lead writer for four of President Obama's White House Correspondents' Dinner speeches. Mr. Litt began his, this amazing journey at the White House at the young age of 24. So uh, no pressure to all you 20-year-olds in the audience. Before serving as President Obama's comedian in chief, Litt was a field organizer in the 2008 campaign and had interned with West Wing writers. Following his departure from the White House in early 2016, Mr. Litt has become a head writer and producer for Funny or Die in Washington, DC. David Litt's new book, Thanks Obama, My Hopey, Changey White House Years, chronicles his time at the White House, from the highs of the 2012 re-election campaign to the hard work needed for healthcare implementation. It offers a reflection of his journey as a presidential speechwriter, marked by his humorous and optimistic style. In today's political landscape, when it can be hard at times to be optimistic, I'm reminded of the phrase, when the truth hurts, tell a joke. Please join me in welcoming Mr. David Litt. So David, I'm one who believes that you shouldn't put off till uh, tomorrow what you can do today. So you've 30, you're 30 and you've written a memoir. Yes, that's right. Uh, <laughs> thus getting it out of the way. Well, that seemed like a good idea, you know, and then, then I can check that off the list. And presumably, if I learn something else in the rest of my life, I won't know what to do with it. But Yeah. Um, why? Why did you decide to write this book? Uh, so I wanted to write this book because I had read a lot of great White House books. Um, I read your book. That was, it's one of the ones to which I'm referring. And they're... Thank you, that's what I was hoping for. Yeah, I, that's right. Um, no, but and I do think uh, most White House books are about what it's like to be indispensable to the president, to be in the inner circle of an administration. And I was not indispensable to the president, and I was not in the inner circle of the administration. Um, what I was was a 24-year-old, extremely scared of embarrassing himself in front of his boss's boss, except my boss's boss was Barack Obama. And I wanted to write about that, because I think that for many of us, hopefully for a lot of you in the room, uh, there's a kind of gap in the reading you can do about what it's like to be in public service. There's the 
you can read about what it's like to be a very important person in public service, but that um, part where you're starting out and you don't really know where you fit in the world in the way that maybe most of us in our 20s aren't sure where we fit in the world, but you're also trying to be part of this thing that's bigger than yourself. Uh, that's what I wanted to talk about. And then also, I had lots of fun stories about the times I embarrassed myself in front of the president, and I felt like those needed to be in a book. And probably better in your book than his book. <laughs> that's that's um, certainly true. So uh, you, uh, it, you're not one of these people who grew up freakishly thinking, man, I want to be in politics. I want to work in the White House someday. That wasn't. That wasn't uh, your focus. Uh, you kind of fell into it. There are a few other things you explored. You explored comedy, right? You were, gonna, you were here, not, uh, I guess, in Madison. Where, where were you working at The Onion? No, or were the, you just This was when The Onion was in New York. So they moved. They started oh, in Madison. I think they were in Chicago for a little while. They're and then, here now. And then they moved back. And yes. they had an interlude in New York. And so I was, um, that was the summer, I, because I'm a New Yorker, I was, te I was learning to drive at, eight, at 20. And when I wasn't taking driving lessons, I was interning at The Onion. I learned how to drive in New York. That's a tough place to learn how to drive. Yeah, but then you get really good at... at comedy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's the root of all comedy. Yeah. That... Um, so you worked at The Onion. Yeah, I worked at The Onion the summer after my junior year of college, figured that that's what I wanted to do, and then discovered that I wasn't good at it. Um, I... The, uh, the, my job at The Onion was to mostly to catch typos, but then the interns got to write jokes about the weather. And that was our special little bit. It, was, it wasn't even on the website, but on the printed paper, at least back then, you would see a joke about the weather if you really looked hard, like with a magnifying glass. And that was, those were written by the interns. That was the big special experience we got. <laughs> and we would compete furiously to see which of the four interns would get a joke in the, the weather joke in. And by the end of the summer, um, my fellow interns had each gotten about three or four. One had gotten about six. I had gotten about zero into the paper. And that was when I thought, you know, maybe this place isn't so special after all. And so I, uh, from there, I thought I would join the CIA. Uh, yes. Because the classic path from the onion to the right. CIA. <laughs> Well, I think actually if you go to the CIA, if you go to Langley, it's full, full of former Onion staff, I bet. Because <laughs> um, I, 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 I didn't really have a set. I just figured if I was searching for bin Laden, when people asked me, what are you doing now that you've graduated college, I would tell them, you know, I'm finding bin Laden, and then they would say, oh, that makes sense. And I, didn't, I wasn't sure what I, else I could do that would make sense. Because you went to Yale, and your classmates were all off to highfalutin jobs, so... Finding bin Laden would have been right in keeping with... Yes, they were all off to highfalutin jobs or, because this was 2008, they were finding out that their highfalutin jobs no longer existed on Wall Street, but yes. one of those two things. Um, but it was, you know, in a sense, I, didn't, I knew I didn't want to go to law school, which was the, the typical thing that I think my classmates did if you didn't know what you wanted to do. And so I did the other thing, which was, you know, well, maybe I'll try to catch bin Laden, but that didn't work because I had smoked pot in, uh, not while trying to catch bin Laden, that would be really bad. I, the, the interviewer at, from the CIA said, you know, have you used illegal substances in the last 12 months? And I explained, yes, I had. I, I smoked marijuana two months earlier, and that was the end of the interview. They said, normally we like rule breakers, but uh, we had some rule that we have, you can't interview anyone who's done anything like that in, in the last But as we discussed, year. they probably were testing you to see if, if you could keep a secret. Well, that's right. I mean, this is, uh, this is what I, I, I say this in the book. If I had lied to the CIA, like right now, instead of addressing you all, I would be, you know, uh, poisoning some drug kingpin somewhere with, with a dart gun concealed inside a slightly larger dart gun. Um, but but instead I am uh, instead I'm here so you know it's a, a sliding doors situation. If I see you reaching for a dart gun, I'm going to move over. Yes, on that this, uh, yeah, duck. Um, and uh, but uh, so so the CIA didn't uh, the CIA didn't work out. And then you had this moment of inspiration. Uh, talk about that. So um, and, and it's I will say it's a very surreal experience to have to be talking about this moment of inspiration with somebody who was on the other end helping to create this moment of inspiration. This whole, it, I didn't bring this up in the podcast either, but the, just know that I, I find this all very strange. Um, I was on a plane in 2008, January 3rd, and 
I was watching the in-flight free cable, and nothing good was on any of the ASPN, so I turned to CNN, and this Barack Obama person was delivering a speech after the Iowa caucuses, which he had just won. And I knew about Senator Obama at the time. He, I had seen his speech in 2004 at the Democratic Convention. Some of my more earnest friends were off in Iowa taking their and time to And you were a little volunteer. disdainful of that. You thought they had become sort of groupies. Yeah, I thought there was no way that he could win. I mean, this is a guy with the middle name Hussein, and, and the first name Barack, and the last name Obama. Like, there's no, none of this seems promising. Yes, And no matter how you organize the names. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Hussein Obama Barack is not going to win <laughs> that primary. And so I, um, yeah, I did uh, sort of find myself thinking like, OK, well, you know, they're young and immature, but I'm, I'm too mature for that. Uh, but, I, but I had nothing better to do while the plane landed. And I was curious, and I watched this speech. And I would say within 30 seconds, I was, uh, as I described in the book, a, an Obama bot. I mean, I was one of those young people who popped up all over the country who would not stop talking about Barack Obama. And, um, one of the things we didn't get to when we just recorded the podcast was it was specifically the fact that he asked us who were watching, whether in the room or on TV, it was the first time I felt like a candidate was saying, I can do something big, but I need your help. You know, he, he pointed to all the organizers and said, uh, they represent that most American of ideals that faced with impossible odds, people who love this country can change it. And I think those, that was the moment where like before he said that sentence, I was one person, and I think I was a different person after that. I mean, there's very, very few moments in a person's life where you can say, OK, that was when yeah. my life totally changed. But it did. You, usually it takes a paragraph. You, <laughs> yeah. It was just a, yeah. just a sentence. Well, huh? I found from speech writing, it can often take a lot more than that and still be <laughs> unsuccessful. So. But the, uh, the truth is that, that I think he wrote that because that was what we all were feeling in that room that night, that this improbable thing had happened because a lot of particularly young people, but not all young people, I have friends here who were uh, not as young, who were out there working uh, in, uh, in Iowa. But uh, there was a sense of a sort of a citizen participation that really drove that. So you were taken by that. Yeah, I think it was, it, it was this moment where it was somebody saying, this is an extraordinary thing. First of all, it was a little humbling because, I, again, I did not think that Obama, Barack Hussein, was going to win a caucus. And so to realize that he did, you know, and, and to maybe more, more things are possible than I thought. And this was back in the olden days when the idea that anything was possible was a good thing. And so... <laughs> uh, and so... For, it just opened up this, this world of possibility, and I wanted to be part of that. And not only that, I felt like he was saying, you need to be part of it. And one of the things in that moment, and I don't, I mean, it's totally possible there are other people here who had that, watched that same speech and had that same epiphany, where it, millions of people, I, I think, across the country simultaneously felt, he's talking to me, which is really a rare gift for, for a political figure, and, and the moment needs to be right as well. And it just was one of those moments that, you know, I think so many of us, it totally changed where we were headed. And then, uh, I guess five weeks later or so, you're driving down to Rhode Island from your campus. Uh, talk about that journey, because that's one of the most uh, colorful uh, anecdotes in a very colorful book. <laughs> so. I um, had a sort of hopeless crush on this young woman who I call Amy in the book. And she had rejected basically all of my extremely romantic offers. I mean, like half a bottle of Yellowtail, or, you know, <laughs> this was back when I still had The Sopranos on DVD. So it was like, you want to come over and watch The Sopranos on DVD? That didn't work. Uh, but it turned out that she had caught the Obama bug. And so I, I sort of tried one last thing. The, the day of the Rhode Island primary, I said, hey, want to basically cut class, and we'll just go drive to Providence, Rhode Island, and knock on doors. And she said, yeah, that sounds great. At first, I was like, really? And then, before she could reconsider, I borrowed my roommate's car without asking, which you pointed out is called stealing. Theft, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree with that, um, especially if, if you know, a court of law is involved. Uh, but I. <laughs> So I um, assertively borrowed my roommate's car. <laughs> and I, when we drove to Providence, which is about two hours from New Haven, 
And it was not a very successful door knocking experience. I mean, most people there were clearly going to vote for Hillary Clinton in the primary. It was not a surprise later that night when we realized just how badly Obama had lost that state. Um, but there was still, it, there was this incredibly giddy feeling that just came with being on the cusp, like the world was going to be different and we were going to be part of it. That um, even people who had no interest in voting for Barack Obama were so happy to see us there because the idea that we were out there in the cold talking about these issues and trying to do something for America made people feel inspired. It didn't make them feel inspired enough to vote for our candidate, but it did make them feel inspired. I remember you know, some, someone offered us lemon squares. I mean, someone else said, are you Jewish? And I was a little surprised by that question, but I said, yes, wondering if that would lead them to vote for Obama. <laughs> uh, it, it didn't, but they brought me in and we had like, we did, uh, you know, we did prayer, you know, we did, uh, kind of made mozi. Uh, it, and um, so they were Jewish. So they were Jewish. Yes, yes it would have been. Because that would have been, been really odd. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, they said we're, we're, I'm doing my own survey. Like, you have your questions. I have my questions. Um, and, you know, fortunately, uh, this wasn't that. And so, um, but it was that just that feeling of you know definitely they didn't vote for Obama, but there was this feeling of togetherness that. Even if we disagreed, we were part of the same, the same country, the same family. We were all in this together. And on the way back, I, I thought about trying to, to kiss, uh, in the book, you know, Amy, the person I call Amy, I thought about trying to kiss her, like making a move. And that just didn't seem, it didn't seem equal to how unprecedented the entire moment was. So instead, I sort of heard myself say, hey, you want to ba drive back to New Haven naked? And, uh, and I was not like totally unfamiliar with streaking. This was, so I don't know, uh, at Yale, all things are very organized and hierarchical and there's lots of applying. So there's like uh, a group of people who are responsible for public nudity that you have to apply to. <laughs> and I, I had applied and I was on the executive board for public nudity. So it's not like I was, I was you know, unused to being naked, but I was not used, I'd never driven naked. And in a I, stolen car. In a, in a borrowed car. <laughs> and uh, you know, we're filming this. Um, so, uh, so I uh, was uh, fairly surprised, but uh, kind of not, actually. This was Barack Obama's America. Anything was possible. And she said, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, and, and I don't remember getting how we, we managed logistically, There's how we got our clothes. a whole new meaning to yes, we can. <laughs> It, it really does. Uh, and, and we managed to, uh, to get all our clothes off in the car. And I remember that speed bumps were a real issue. <laughs> but, but then we got on the highway, and it was, I mean, it was great. First of all, I will say it was incredibly liberating. I, I, my streaking days are behind me. But um, if anybody is still in the mood, it is fun. You should try it. Uh, but more importantly, it was just so we were kind of zooming down the highway. Uh, trying not to pass any cop cars too closely. Um, we briefly tried to break into an aquarium, which is one of those things that just makes sense at the time. Long story. That didn't work. We got back on the highway. And uh, what I say in the book is that I wish that I could say that my true defining moment in politics was watching that speech on January 3rd um, or, or watching the race speech a few weeks Mm -hmm. After South Cal oh yes, in Philadelphia. It was, yeah, yes. it was a few weeks after. It yeah. was after uh, whatever was going on with me and Amy had already sputtered out. But uh, but really, my defining moment in politics came with you know my bare cheeks on the seat of my roommate's Nissan, um, and it was that sense of you know this is uh, what I, the way I put it. It's the same way I felt about um, then candidate Obama that we were not just fighting for change we were change I mean, yes. we were we were driving it down that highway and learning how to turn the other way. cheek right? that's yeah. that's true <laughs> um, all sorts of things and i think uh, and and i do one thing i've been worried about because my roommate at the time she knew that i borrowed her car fairly frequently without asking um, i don't think she knew that i borrowed it in order to drive naked in it so uh, I yes. haven't heard back from her since the book came out, but <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I may be getting a note and a bill. <laughs> the, uh, after you graduated, you went off to Ohio. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as you point out, you were called a, an Obama fellow. 
but you were basically an unpaid volunteer, an indentured servant, you said, uh, in Worc Worcester, Ohio. Talk about that uh, experience. Yeah, I st well, so I started in, I did my indentured Ground servitude zero, really, in, right? in Canton, in the, yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons I wanted, I wanted to go to Ohio because uh, I wanted to make sure that, I, I knew it was going to be a ton of work, and I figured I wanted to be someplace that was close enough that win or lose, we didn't wonder whether, you know, the organizing made a difference there. Um, and uh, and that, that's, I'd never been to Ohio before. Um, I guess I had been to Chicago, but that was actually as much as you'd never Midwest been an been organizer, to. right? And I definitely never been an organizer. No, I had been, um, I mean, you know, it's weird. You sort of draw on the things you have done. So I had done improv comedy, which involved sort of thinking quickly on your feet and finding ways to uh, build relationships very quickly um, that didn't exist before. And so I said, well, we'll just treat it like that, but with a slightly less funny approach. <laughs> And um, so I had never been an organizer. Uh, my job was, and one of the things that I think was fairly unique or certainly new about the Obama campaign was my job was not so much to knock on doors and talk to voters as it was to find volunteers and over time train them to be organizers so that they then had volunteers who had volunteers who went and talked to voters. So it was building this organization that eventually was fairly self-sustaining on election day. And one of the things that was really remarkable about that model was not just the results that we achieved. And it was really cool, because in Worcester, Ohio, uh, it, it was like all the Democrats were closet cases. Like, people would come in and say, I'm, don't tell anyone, but I'm a Democrat. <laughs> and then they'd come into our office and see their neighbor, who was also a Democrat, and they had no idea. And every, you know, and, and this kind of gradual awakening took place. And that was uh, amazing, both in terms of the results it achieved, but also in this way that you saw people who didn't come from, you know, I came from the kind of household and, and school environment I imagine many of you do here, where people constantly tell you you can change the world, which is a wonderful thing. But to have people who never thought they could change the world gradually come to this realization that the same thing, I guess, that I came to watching that speech. Not only do I have the agency to make a difference, but I have the obligation to do it, because no one else is going to do it if I don't. Um, it was amazing to be part of that. And, and, and to do it you know, in just five months. At the time, I thought five months, like that's a whole semester. You know, that's a long time. <laughs> but now looking back, it's remarkable how quickly we, we stood that up. I, I asked you earlier about, uh, earlier in our other conversation, about uh, the woman uh, who uh, was working in your headquarters uh, and uh, who uh, had a, an injury a, a disc injury, couldn't sit, couldn't stand, and yet she insisted on continuing to make her calls. Talk about that. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I remember very clearly was a moment, I, it was probably in September, um, and it was getting cold out, and this woman, Wendy, uh, said, and you know, we offered her a seat, and she said, I can't, I can't sit. I have a slip disc, um, and I, it hurts to sit, and it, and it hurts to stand but I can make calls if I'm walking. So she took one of our cell phones in, in our little campaign headquarters, and she made calls just pacing around the block. And you could see that even though she was, she was walking, she wasn't sitting or standing, she was still in agony. And I never told a volunteer to stop making calls. I mean, I, was, I, I had a reputation. But this time I made an exception, and I said, you know, Wendy, you really you don't have to be here. And she said, no, I do have to be here. Because if I'm not making these calls, Barack Obama is not going to become president, and I'm not going to get the kind of health care that I need to get better. Um, and it was, I mean, it was one of those moments. Uh, one of the things, I mean, this is not an advice book, as you can tell from some of the decisions that I've made. <laughs> but, but I do think if you're, especially if you're a student here and you're interested in politics, I feel so lucky that I started in field because the more time you spend in politics, the easier it is to get removed from the people who are really, whose lives are going to be different one way or the other based on what happens, um, on decisions that political figures make. But when you're in field, you can't help but see that all the time. I mean, there, there was Wendy, but the, every day, every week, someone would come in and you'd say, oh yeah, this is why we're doing this. This is why we're fighting this You way. also got exposed to people who weren't enamored of the idea of Barack Obama uh, as president. And as you describe it, um, there are some of the elements of things that we then saw. People say, well, how could we have been there in 2008 and we're, uh, end up with Donald Trump 
in 2016, having spent time in Ohio, which went for Trump in a pretty big way in 2016, you probably were less surprised. Well, it's interesting. I mean, Wayne County, Ohio, where, where I worked, was one of those sort of kind of quintessential co counties that went for McCain by a medium amount, Romney by a slightly larger amount, and then for Trump by a huge amount. And uh, I mean, I remember, to me, and, and I've heard other um, Obama alumni say similar things, that it seemed like there was a turning point when Sarah Palin became the, no the vice presidential nominee, that there was this kind of undercurrent. I remember being outside an unemployment center at, uh, in Canton, Ohio, early in that year, and I was registering voters, and um, you know we registered anybody, but uh, somebody asked me who I was working for, and I said, I'm working for the Obama campaign. And he said, no, I never vote for Obama. And I said, why not? And he, he went, and I remember thinking, you wouldn't vote for Obama because you were injecting heroin? <laughs> and it took me a second, and I realized what he meant was, you know, he was pointing, he was tapping on his skin, he was talking about skin color. So there was some of that. But it was after Palin became the nominee that the, not just racism, but all of it kind of exploded and became, it got out in the open. I went to a Panera in, in Worcester, in, uh, in Ward 3, which was kind of the, the swing ward of Worcester. And I went and got a sandwich, and I came back, and I had a, um, one of the Hope poster bumper stickers on my car. And I came back, and there was this elderly gentleman yelling at my bumper sticker. And there was no one else around. He was just angry at my bumper sticker. And I, I don't know, I mean, I think it would be um, too simple to say, well, that was only because Barack Obama was going to be the first black president. I think it was just in so many ways, there was the sense that here's this person who is the other. I mean, there's so much otherness there. He was the first urban president, the first president to grow up in a city, I think. Is that right? Um, you know, there's the names that we've talked about. There's the fact that, uh, you know, that he listened to Ludacris and not Pat Boone. I mean, the, just the number of ways that he represented something culturally different and the backlash against that that had already started. And particularly out in, in the county, I mean, I remember having uh, volunteers who lived in rural areas come in and say, you know, I need a new yard sign because someone shot mine up or you know, my mailbox got smashed off the post in the middle of the night. And it wasn't happening to everybody, but it was happening. And I, I, so I don't think that for those of us who experienced that, the rise of Trump or um, some of the movements that preceded Trump were very surprising. You, uh, you, like so many others, went to Washington, so many other young organizers uh, after the election, thinking that you'd go to work uh, in the administration further to the cause and so on. That didn't happen right away for you. Yeah, the first, I, I moved to Washington without a clear plan at all, basically thinking, you know, hope and change are there, so I'll be there. And, you know, I, I figured it would be sort of like finding your house at Hogwarts. Like, I'd get to Washington and there would be a sorting and then someone would tell me, here's where you fit into Barack Obama's America. And uh, it was more complicated than that. I mean, one of the things that I discovered was just how many thousands of people, you know, there is this sense that everyone has, and it's something I love about campaigns, everyone has a sense of personal ownership over the campaign. When you win, you feel like I personally elected a president. And then I got to DC and discovered several thousand people also had personally elected a president. <laughs> and many of them had actually elected that president a little bit more than I had. And so it was not uh, the sort of freewheeling world of the campaign became much more bureaucratic and much more DC, much more like DC. Um, and so I, I started, I was an intern at a crisis communications firm. I sort of took that internship assuming it would only last for a few weeks and then I'd find a job in the Obama world somewhere. Um, and I stayed at, the, the, at the, that internship for a full few months. I was undoubtedly the worst intern in Washington DC during those months. Um, I, uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier, so the, this was a firm I generally felt for companies that deserve to be in crisis but were hoping to get out of it somehow, <laughs> uh, which doesn't really justify the fact that then I began um, violating the dress code. Uh, I, I had a bunch of shirts I had bought in a summer in Beijing that were all variations <laughs> on the theme of polyester. And I started coming in it to work every day in my polyester shirt and I would bring my laptop that the campaign had given me and I moved it into the break room so uh, my office was basically set up in the break room. So people who worked there would come in and discover the intern working in the break room all the time. And I did this because if I worked in the break room, you couldn't see that I was only playing Minesweeper all day. <laughs> and then in what was surely a cry for help, 
uh, I began answering work-related questions exclusively in analogies to the game of Minesweeper I was playing at the time. Uh, so what that means, for those of you who are, I can see a lot of confused faces, what that means is that somebody would say, so David, uh, is that memo going to be ready? And I would say, well, you know how when you're playing Minesweeper and at the beginning it's really easy, but at the end you have about five mines left and there's seven empty boxes, so you don't really know, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it gets a lot more complicated because you know there's a higher risk with every decision you make. So that memo might take a while. <laughs> and I thought I was getting away with it and I clearly was not. So I almost got fired from that internship. Uh, found a, a, one that suited me a little better at a, a private sector speech writing firm called West Wing Writers. And that's where I learned how to write speeches. And from there, um, I guess it was about two years later, I was about to leave and go to, the, to Chicago and just try to work on the re-election campaign doing something when uh, my bosses at the firm sent you and some other people my resume just to sort of say, hey, you should know this person exists. And Valerie Jarrett, the president's senior advisor, was looking for a speechwriter and said, basically, if you apply for this job, or, or I think Favreau told me this, if you apply for the job, you'll basically be the only person applying. So why don't you stay here and work in the White House? And I said, yeah, OK, I could do that. Mm -hmm. That sounds all right. And that's what I ended up doing. As you describe your experience in the White House as kind of a junior level uh, writer when you arrived there, um, and really throughout, I mean, for various reasons, it is uh, the combination of exhilaration and dread. Uh, explain that uh, to people who, there are a few people here who haven't worked in the White House. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the way that I, you know, I think, I feel like everyone sort of starts with the West Wing, right? When you think about, or at least certainly I did. Uh, and there's a reason that the West Wing probably didn't do an episode about Rob Lowe's speechwriter character going to CVS and buying a mouth guard because he grinds his teeth in his sleep from stress. Uh, but I did that. And I wanted to write about that side of a job like the one that I had. I mean, I was not writing the biggest speeches that the president delivered by any means. But even when I was just working on the jokes or working on a weekly address or something comparatively small, um, I think there was that sense of responsibility. I mean, I think the, like, you learn why people use the word crushing to describe responsibility, that, that physical sense of pressure um, in a way that I definitely didn't realize before that. And I think that probably came from the president on down. It certainly infused the entire building, where people, no matter what people were doing, people came to work and felt like, in some small way, my performance at my job makes it easier or harder for the most important person on Earth to do his job. And that's an amazing feeling. I mean, it's an extraordinary, you know, all the words that get used are all cliches, but they're true. It's an honor. It's a privilege. Uh, it can be magical, but it can also be extremely uh, terrifying, especially when you're young and you're, I mean, I was kind of surprised that people would pay me to do anything, let alone write speeches in the White House. Um, you, you ultimately uh, took over the joke writing uh, portfolio in the White House. You contributed uh, jokes early. One was in 2011, uh, you wrote a joke that was supposed to be included in the White House correspondence routine, President's Comedic. Uh, routine and you were outraged when the joke got edited. Why don't you tell well, that story? So I had been at the White House for all of about four weeks in, for the 2011 correspondence dinner and that was when John Lovett was still running the, the process for the jokes. And I had sent in a joke about that middle name uh, but making fun of all the, the conspiracy theories around the president and the joke was uh, you may think you know the 2012 Republican nominee Tim Pawlenty sounds all American, but have you heard his real middle name? It's Tim Bin Laden, Paul Enti. And I really liked this joke. <laughs> because first of all, it was edgy. I don't think the president had ever talked about Bin Laden in that context. And second of all, Bin Laden, bad person, great ring to it. it. Just, you know, Bin Laden. It's got the rhyming and then the hard sound in the middle. So I thought this is going to be a great joke. And then, and I could see, I didn't, wasn't in the meetings, but I could see the different drafts as they came in. So I knew that joke had made it into the draft, and I had had a couple others, but this was the one I felt really good about. And then you and, and Favreau and Lovett went into the Oval with the president, and I knew that was happening, and you emerged however long after. And the, when the new draft came around, bin Laden had been changed to Hosni, Hosni Mubarak, the Egyptian strongman who was deposed in 
the Arab Spring. And I was not happy about this, because Hosni is not a funny word. <laughs> it's a very flabby word. It doesn't end the way bin Laden does. And it's also not nearly as edgy. And I remember having this moment where I thought, you know, I'm the new guy. I've been here for four weeks. But the White House needs my opinion. Like, America needs me to fix this joke. <laughs> And so I, I pulled out my BlackBerry. And I, you know, I, even in four weeks, I'd gotten very good at thumb typing on my BlackBerry. And I typed out my manifesto about this joke. And I was going to send it to, to Favreau and love it. And then the way I put it in the book is it was, there was like a tiny bureaucratic angel just sitting on my shoulder, you know, whispering, stay in your lane. <laughs> And so I, I listened to that angel, and I put down my BlackBerry, and I went to the dinner that night. And the next day, I was, uh, I was going home from a music festival with my friends. And I had, uh, at the music festival, I had really decided to rebel. I turned my BlackBerry to silent instead of vibrate. It's a big deal. And I turned it to vibrate, and immediately vibrated. And it was uh, remarks of President Obama. It was a final draft from Ben Rhodes, the chief foreign policy speechwriter. Uh, on, uh, and it had the acronym UBL, and I had no idea what UBL stood for. And then I read it, and it said, remarks to President Obama on the death of Osama bin Laden. And I thought, OK, I am extremely yeah, glad I did not hit send. about a killer joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am glad I did not hit send on that email. Um, and I also think that was the, more seriously, that was the time when I fully began to realize even when you're doing little things in the White House, they are not little things. Um, and it's something I think about a lot when I think about our current politics, that you know the um, how how much even the little things matter, let alone the the big things, and it's one of the you know there's there's lots of reasons to worry, but that's one of mine. I was in that meeting as you mentioned when uh, the president uh, excised Bin Laden and inserted Hosni, and he looked at your joke and he said, Bin Laden, Bin Laden, that's so yesterday. He said, let's take that out. He was like, yesterday, what are you talking yeah. about? We, that's a great joke. No, no, let's, let's take it out. L let me ask you about humor. L let me ask you about humor and uh, the pre He obviously was very good at it, uh, appreciated a good joke, knew how to deliver a good joke. What, what was the key to making those presidential speeches where he had to be funny uh, work? So there were a few things, I think, that were essential to a, a good set of jokes for, for one of the correspondence centers. The first one was that we had a really large, talented team of people. So most of the speeches that we would do in the White House, if I was writing a speech about infrastructure, um, I would hold the pen on the speech. The chief speechwriter, either John Favreau or Cody Keenan, would edit the speech. And then it would be seen by the president, usually the night before. For jokes, it was closer to having a writer's room, where you know, I would be writing jokes myself, but also after Lovett moved to Hollywood, he would still be writing jokes from there. Um, you know, I, I think in the, uh, in the book, I, I sort of out you as the originator of these long pun-filled email chains that would go around. <laughs> um, and you know, we'd have some comedy writers from Hollywood as well who would, who would pitch jokes. So we would end up with about 600 jokes, I would guess, before that would come into my inbox at some point uh, during the years when I was responsible for making sure that everything went the way it was supposed to. And of those, I would guess 40 would go to the president for the first time about a week beforehand. So that was the first part of it, was just writing so many jokes, knowing that most of them will be not quite right. But you, there's no secret to it. You just do it over and over and over again, and you see which ones work. Um, the second thing that I think was very impressive about President Obama's sense of humor, in addition to his timing, which was really good, was that he, I think he had a clear sense, enough self-awareness to say, this is my public persona, and here's how I can play off it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So he didn't do jokes. You know, There, were, there was uh, one or two times when I would read a joke, or he would read a joke that we'd written, and he'd say, that would be funny if a comedian did it, which is like a polite way of saying, let's not use that joke, please, and he'd get rid of it. But for the most part, he was doing jokes that were based on him kind of playing himself. And I think if you don't have that self-awareness to know what's funny when you say it and what's not, it, it doesn't work. Um, and then I think, I mean, it, we've talked about it a few times just in the last minute, but I do think the fact that he had a really strong sense of comic timing and also of how to write a joke. I mean, I would get back um, the, the edits that he would make on the, the day of the correspondence dinner. So, 
you know, uh, usually we would have our final run through at, let's say, noon on that Saturday. And then he would go, he would read it one more time and make handwritten changes. And then the last thing I would really do before the speech was enter those changes into the computer for final draft. And the edits were always really precise in a way that you generally don't see from people who aren't writing comedy. I mean, most of the time, the difference between saying this, but that, and this, however, that, doesn't make a difference in a speech. But for jokes, it can be the difference between life and death, you know, funny or not funny. And you could see, you know, he would add a comma right where it needed to be, or he would change a word around. And it, it was... Um, which he would do in, in his speeches as well. Right. He had a great sense of the musicality of how words played. But uh, the, the one thing that, uh, you know, I, I was all alone at the beginning of this journey writing these things for the Gridiron Club and so on. The one thing that he was very aware of was the need for self-deprecation, yeah. and particularly given the puffed up nature of all of his advance notice and all of that. Um, and he was, I need more self-deprecating jokes. Uh, and uh, it wasn't just him. Uh, George W. Bush, uh, uh, Landon Parvin, who wrote his mm -hmm. uh, speeches, was great at self-deprecating humor. Um, at the risk of this sounding like a loaded question, as you look at the incumbent, uh, he doesn't seem like a guy who would enjoy a good joke at his own expense. You don't think so? No. <laughs> But I mean, is, is, that, is, that a, is that a tool, is that a deficiency, a tool that he doesn't have that ultimately is a, a loss to him? Yes, I think that self-deprecation for a president is, it's both a useful tool and the ability to be self-deprecating indicates something comforting about that person. So I think there's something that for all, I mean, the Correspondence Center is a totally strange and, and sometimes a little gross institution. And I'd be the deserves first. Deserves some deprecation itself. It, it does deserve yeah. some deprecation. And I think it probably doesn't have as much self-deprecation as it expects from, <laughs> from the president. But I think that um, there is something both charming and, and encouraging about the fact that, you know, the most powerful country on earth elects the most powerful person on earth and then they are responsible for at least once a year in this sort of ritualized setting saying, OK, I get it. I make mistakes. I'm just a person. And I cannot imagine you know, Vladimir Putin taking the, <laughs> taking the mic and t taking himself down a peg. Or, or you know, I can't imagine that happening in most countries, frankly. One, of, one year, I think it was 2013, the Correspondence Center, I think I read an article that it had actually kind of, it had gone viral in China because people in China were so surprised by the idea of a leader being willing to joke about themselves. And um, so I think it is, uh, it, it's a use, and for the same reason, it's a useful tool. And I think um, the fact that President Trump, I, I think it's fair to say, is, you know, he told one self-deprecating joke at the Al Smith dinner, except it was about his wife. <laughs> um, it was a good joke, actually. Do you remember that joke? No. He said, uh, he, it, it was the one good joke, because at the Al Smith dinner, which is the sort of the correspondence dinner for the campaign, um, he got booed for most of the night. And what, I remember one of his jokes, the punchline was, Hillary hates Catholics, which regardless of what you think about that sentiment, is just not a joke. And it was very frustrating. But one of his jokes was, uh, you know, the media is so, un like everybody's so unfair to my campaign. You know, Michelle Obama goes out, she gives a great speech, everybody oh, yeah, loves so her. That's a great My joke. wife goes out, gives the exact same speech, and everyone's upset. <laughs> that was a that, that was, was that was a great that joke. That was a real that was yeah. like that might be the one thing that Donald Trump has ever said that I thought, oh, that's pretty good. We're, and No, go ahead. No, so all I was gonna say is, but even that was that was as close as he got to self deprecating, but he wasn't willing to touch his own ego. And I think the fact that he he can't do that or won't do that is both uh, makes him a less effective president and also suggests something that we see come out in more worrying ways about his performance as president. We're going to take some questions. So if you want to line up behind this mic, Matt's already up here. Uh, and we're going to take uh, student questions first. Um, and if only students line up, we'll take student questions last as well. Um, I want to ask you uh, what, what I found most interesting about your book. It's really entertaining, and it's funny, and it's uh, all the things one would hope, but uh, the arc of the book is uh, from you as kind of a naif, 
in certain ways, this idealistic young guy, to someone who experienced a sense of disappointment uh, and is uh, a little more hardened, yet still idealistic at the end. Talk about your arc. Yeah, I, the way I thought about the book and, and my own story, and I wanted to think about really what, what, what had happened to me and, and all of the people I worked with, and what did it feel like, not just to go through and chronicle it, but I wanted to spend as much time as I could thinking about the inner life of uh, you know, myself, and I think probably many of my colleagues can, can relate to it. Um, I think a lot of Washington books exist on this scale where on one end of the spectrum you're naive and idealistic and you believe in stuff, and on the other end of the spectrum you're a realist and you're also a cynic and you've become disillusioned. And that wasn't true to my experience. First of all, I don't understand why disillusionment is spoken of as if it's the bad thing. Like the opposite of disillusionment is illusionment. So I don't see why we're all worried about being disillusioned. To me, anybody, you know, it's what it's the, uh, to sort of a play on that uh, old Winston Churchill quote, I think, about, you know, anybody, uh, anybody uh, beware of uh, young conservatives or old liberals. But that anybody who is an adult is in some way disillusioned by the real world. I mean, we have to be. Um, that said, we also have to believe in stuff or life isn't really worth living and also we can't make the kind of progress we need to make as a country. And my, my book ended up trying to figure out how to have that story arc of becoming disillusioned, I think it's fair to say, certainly at times, but not ending there and not saying that's the end of the story, but to say how is it that looking back on it now, uh, absolutely, there are things that I thought, I thought all the problems were going to be solved by the time I was 25. I was wrong. But I'm also really proud of the work that I did with, together with all the people who, who I got to be a part of this thing with. I'm really proud to have served a president that I still believe in. And I'm also absolutely confident that there are millions upon millions upon millions of Americans whose lives are better because Barack Obama was the guy sitting behind the desk and it, whose lives are better because of all of us who helped put him there. Um, and yet, I also feel a little disillusioned in certain ways. And how is it possible to be disillusioned and to still believe? How can you hold both of those ideas in your head at the same time? And uh, I think, to some extent, that is harder than being either um, sort of purely idealistic or purely cynical. But I also think it's important because uh, unless we are able to be re pragmatists and idealists at the same time, it can be very hard to move forward as individuals or as a country. Let's take some questions. Hi, my name is Matt Enloe, and I'm a third year student at the law school. I really enjoyed your story about people coming together in the offices during the campaign. It seems like it's become more difficult to build communities, especially with increasing polarization. What ideas do you have for bringing people, especially young people, together in the future? OK, so how can we heal a divided nation? Um, Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, how much time do we have? By, by um, the time people are 25. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I, um, I do think that one of the things that I found encouraging is actually if you look at younger people, um, there still is polarization. And I, I think we're going to have to figure out how to deal with the fact that the internet brings out the worst in all of us. Um, and, and I don't know the answer to that, but we're going to have to treat it as a problem, not a fact of life. Um, but if you look at young people, I think there is a sense that, uh, of sort of shared values um, that is missing from a lot of the country as a whole. Uh, I think a lot of, and the president talked about this often, especially when it came to marriage equality, that he, was, would, he would talk about how his kids were surprised that this was even an issue. And I think there are, like, there are young people who look at all the stuff that we're fighting over as a country and are saying, what are you even fighting about? Like, mom and dad, why are you fighting? And I think that there is something that, that I actually find encouraging. I think the other thing that is really hard, and I definitely don't do it all the time, because we're in a world where being snarky and being sort of like, like kind of clapback culture, it's much more fun. And you get a much better response from just saying, like, let me tell you who sucks, and then naming names. But to figure out a way to have that discipline that says it might be less rewarding in the short term, but it's much more rewarding in the long term. To, to say, OK, where can we try to find some unity that isn't obvious here? And one of the things that, I really, uh, that really appealed to me about President Obama when he ran in 2008 was it was similarly a time after the Bush presidency where we felt like things weren't going in the right direction. We felt very torn apart as a country. And he could have said, 
the problem is 51, you know, 49 percent of the country. So 51 percent of the country should vote for me. And instead, he was looking for common ground, even when it, that wasn't always reciprocated. So hopefully, we've solved all the problems now. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Ronan Shatsky. I'm a second year in the college. I'm also from New York, so I get what you're saying about uh, the learning to drive in New York. It's particularly hard because you're learning from other New Yorkers. Which is part of the issue. <laughs> but I'm wondering what it was like to try to write in the president's voice. What were the challenges of trying to bring your own, own voice back a little bit and use the words you would use, the phrasing you would use? I'm wondering if that also affected maybe the way that you write today. Um, it, it is definitely true that sometimes I find myself slipping into things that sound ludicrous if I say them. Uh, you know, I, I, I went, I was in New York the other day when my book came out, and I was with my fiance, and um, we were at a, a Chinese food restaurant. But the, the different people, like it wasn't just uh, Asian people, like Asian American people cooking. It was like African American people and white people and all these different young people. And I had this moment where I turned to her and you know, it's, I said, like, it's cool. It's not just that they're making amazing Chinese food. They're making American food. And she's like, you can't say that. Like, you might have been able to slip that into a speech. It might have sounded, might have sounded cool but like, and you know, soaring. But like, when you say it, it sounds really dumb. Um, so that is, that is true. Uh, but I, um, one of the things that I talk a little bit about in the book is, is the idea of voice. Because for the most part, in my experience, most people sound roughly the same on the page. President Obama was a little different because he is a pretty unique speaker. He could handle a long run on sentence in a way that most politicians cannot. Um, but for the most part, what you really are trying to do as a speechwriter is organize someone's thoughts. You know, somebody has 10 ideas and you're trying to figure out why are they all part of one story? Why are they all one idea? And we were lucky in the White House speechwriting office where President, everything President Obama said as president and most of what he had said before, I mean, even including you know, dreams from my father, he, there was a long history of what President Obama says about certain things and how he thinks about certain things. So we were able to go back and if, we, if I was writing an education speech, I could say what, was, what, what is the common thread in the last eight education speeches, so that will be part of this. Um, and even for jokes, too. I mean, there was a part, you know, a point where I was trying to think, has President Obama ever referred to the first lady as his better half? Does he do that? And so I could go back and say, you know, dear Lexus Nexus, it, has he ever done that? And it turns out he had. And you can put that in a speech, and it sounds authentic, and it is authentic. And that was one thing that was fortunate for us that um, if I was writing for a congressperson or a senator, it might not have been the case. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Zach. I'm a second year in the college. Uh, could you talk more about like how humor has like changed since like social media has become more of a like a public space? Like you know Trump has like Twitter now. Um, like could you specifically talk about like how social media is like amplifying the effects of humor in like the public sphere? Yeah, I think social media has changed humor in a lot of ways. Part of it's changed the the business model. Um, it used to be that it was really hard to get discovered, but that once you got discovered, you would probably become wealthy. Um, it's kind of flipped on its head where thanks to social media, it's not hard to get people to watch what you're doing, but to get people to sustain a career in comedy is harder. Um, and to produce comedy is, is harder in some ways because of that. Uh, politically, I think it's changed because it, as the news cycle has gotten shorter, um, you know, as you pointed out, Trump has Twitter. Uh, at Funny or Die, where I work now, um, our, our model used to be something, some, someone would say something ridiculous we would call up our celebrity friends and we would figure out over the coming week what are we going to film that makes fun of that because it's still a story. Now what happens is the President of the United States says something outrageous on Twitter and we have until his next outrageous Twitter comment to make fun of it. And that can be about 16 seconds. <laughs> so we, have to, we can't call up the celebrity necessarily and say, hey, are you free Thursday? Um, sometimes what we have to do is say, how do we do this using existing footage in a voiceover or something like that? And then the last way that comedy, I think, is really changing is, uh, like all sorts of other things, comedy is now about what's being shared, not just about what's, what's being watched. So it, it's, I think, good for a political comedy because people often share things with a point of view. I mean, the trick is not to share something, not to create something that isn't really funny, but is just telling people what they want to hear so they laugh, but really as a way of kind of agreeing rather than because they appreciate something. But when, when you can create something that is both funny and has a point of view, people feel both uh, that they have permission and, and are excited about sharing that with friends. And so um, that's a kind of comedy that is more vital than it was eight years ago. 
Let me just inter uh, thank, thank you. you. Let me just follow up, and you had mentioned uh, when we were walking over here that it's not for, at, uh, funny or die. It's not easy now. Uh, was it primarily for the reason that you just suggested, or is the overall environment, does the overall environment just not lend itself to, to uh, comedy? I think it depends on the, the week or the month. I think the last two or three weeks between hurricanes and tragedies and this awful shooting yes. in Las Vegas this morning. And let us last all night. keep in our thoughts the uh, families of, of uh, the victims and the victims themselves. Yeah, I, I mean, in times like that, it is, you know, you, you sort of hit pause on comedy, I, I think, in a respectful way. Um, it is hard because the news cycle shrunk. And then finally, it's difficult because I think that com comedians should not be forced to be moral arbiters. Um, usually, the president should be the one taking, showing moral leadership. If they won't, it should be the person running Congress or the person running the Senate. Um, these days, we're in a place where comedians have a platform, and no one else is doing the moral leadership, so they're stepping up. Uh, but it means that people who got into comedy because they wanted to be paid a good living to write fart jokes now find themselves thinking about the moral dimensions of the jokes that they're writing. And I think, I know a lot of people who would love to get back to writing fart jokes, but for the moment, in the political moment, there is this moral dimension to everything going on, not just a political dimension. And it's forcing comedy to, and comedians to say, who is the target of the joke? Is this, am I taking the right attitude here, or am I going to uh, be part of a problem that I don't want to be part of? And I don't. It, it, there's something odd about that much responsibility being put on comedy, but I do think it's to the credit of a lot of comedians. I mean, most recently Jimmy Kimmel, but there have been plenty of others who are stepping up and saying, "Well, if I if if this is the moment that I have to meet, I will meet it." Hi, my name is Aiden, and I'm a fourth-year history political science major in the college. Um, so I have a two-part question, in that it is two questions. Um, and my first question is, what was it like uh, coming like? writing the joke or coming up with the joke where uh, President Barack Obama is making fun of the, uh, like the birther conspiracy where he's, that's like a clip of the Lion King place. Um, and um, my second question is, what kind of advice do you have for young people who are coming out of college like this year or next year um, into a political climate where you just don't really want to work for a government agency because you don't know about if civil service is even a thing that exists anymore, <laughs> I guess. Um, the, the, I'll answer your first question first, because I didn't come up with that joke, so that was very easy. Uh, I, I, that was, I think that was one of John Lovett's jokes. Yeah. And I, I love that joke, and some, especially some of the stuff he did that year at the Correspondence Center, because that was, what I think, the year we, things started to move in a little bit more creative directions. I don't know if, yeah, if you I think, think that so. was the, you know, I think that was a spectacular one. For those who don't remember, that was when Obama said he was offering up his birth tape just to put the birth or dispute and, and it was a clip from the Lion King of the That's great. holding up the lion cub. Yeah, so I, and so it was in the following years as I took a bigger role it was it was nice to have moments like that to say like oh okay you know how do we do something that's different and no, and no one's expecting in that way um, and it was really you know it was, it was fun to be to kind of play around with that. You did the anger translator. Yeah, right? that, I would say that was probably the most outside the box thing that I got to be a part of was uh, when uh, Keegan Michael Key, we brought him in to be Luther Obama's anger translator, his character from the show, <laughs> but on stage with, with President Obama. And, um, and I, I do think it was, it was a result of thinking, what's the thing we haven't done yet? Like, what's going to surprise people? And it was also, I mean, because President Obama was a fan of Key and Peele, he, he liked the anger translator character, perhaps not surprisingly. <laughs> and so uh, to, get to, to get to do that and to get to be part of those, you know, uh, writing a speech about the minimum wage, you're not thinking outside the box necessarily in that way. So it was fun to be part of that. Um, I'll try the second, your second question about people in, want to be involved in civil service, I would say give it a shot. Um, I, I think, the, first of all, if you don't do it, somebody worse than you will probably do it. Uh, and I think there is real value. I mean, it, it's easy for me to say because I'm not in it, but I have friends who are in the State Department or in government as career employees, and I really hope they hang in there and don't leave because my concern is if they leave, somebody who does not share their values at all is going to come in. And, or no one's going to fill that job. Um, certain parts of the civil service, I think, are still functioning well enough that 
and, and doing the right thing. Um, and I think, regardless, the experience that you have will be a really important experience. So it, whether your experience is, actually, I carved out the space for myself, and I'm really proud of the work that I'm doing, or I was here for six months, and then I had to resign because I didn't agree with what my, you know, my boss was up to, um, either way, you're going to learn a lot from that experience, and it's going to make you a better person and a better sort of uh, citizen going forward. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Erica Steiner. I'm a first year here at the college. Um, I'm studying the three most controversial things, political science, religion, and the great pumpkin. Uh, <laughs> and I was curious, you mentioned that as a millennial, um, you clearly were affected by Barack Obama's charisma, which was revolutionary in its ability to mobilize young voters. Um, and many of those voters in 2016 didn't feel that match of charisma in Hillary Clinton and chose not to turn out to vote. As someone who's lived through both of those ages, um, do you think that Democrats specifically as they move forward in 2018 and 2020 will need to find candidates that are as charismatic? Or do you think that Barack Obama was kind of like a one in 44 chance <laughs> of uh, really being able to engage young voters in that way? The exciting thing about that question is you've been tapped as someone who's lived through several ages now. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I still, I was a millennial in the beginning of the question, so I feel like I get to hang on to a tiny bit of my cred. But don't ask me how Snapchat works, because I don't understand. Um, so uh, I guess what I would say is, um, on one hand, it, it is pretty reasonable to expect that our presidential candidates should have charisma. It's part of, of the job. Um, on the other hand, waiting for the next Barack Obama is not a winning proposition. And, and I think in general, not just with uh, looking, looking back on President Obama's tenure, I think it's great that people are realizing, maybe sooner than they would have otherwise, a lot of the decisions that he made actually were harder than they looked and had a bigger impact than we realized. But then this idea of like maybe Obama will come back and save us, that worries me. And one, one of the things that I wanted to, you know, in a, in a not super didactic way, but I think one of the things I hope that people who read the book take away is this idea that nobody, even somebody brilliant like Barack Obama, is going to save us. Like, we're going to save us or we're not, but that needs to be our job. Um, I do think that when it came to uh, this last election, it was disheartening to see it, it become all about charisma. And I feel like one of the things I learned at the White House that I wouldn't have realized otherwise is that the President of the United States is also just a person with a job. And to some extent, you're hiring someone to do a job. And like, would I necessarily, you know, like, there were things where I was like, if we were discussing who I would hire to, you know, help me deal with like the ants that have invaded my kitchen, I would, I wouldn't trust Donald Trump because of some of those qualities. But somehow they don't matter when you're hiring a president. I don't know how that happened, but I think it is a concern. Um, and I think that it's. Uh, we, we do need to figure out a way to get people to understand and to have enough confidence in politics that to say, you need a competent person, you need someone who is good at their job. And, and yes, I think it's okay to also expect them to be charismatic. Thank you. you um, let me uh, grab onto that for a second. You wrote in your book about your first political experience, which was as a, a kid working for John, Kenny, uh, John Kerry, uh, volunteering for him and how disillusioned you were with that experience because you felt that he was so cautious that he didn't really deliver uh, a true uh, argument or the strongest argument he could. And it goes to the fundamental issue of authenticity. How important is that quality? I think authenticity is, is both an important quality and a sort of over uh, and talked about too much because authenticity either Exists well, let's or, move on. Yeah. No, I think authenticity either exists or it doesn't. So if you say someone needs to be more authentic, that, that's not going to, that by definition, it's not going to work very well. Um, I think that. But it could help you identify a candidate who, right. who could be successful. And I think now authenticity matters more, even more than it did in 2004. I think authenticity is something that voters seem to be looking for, the sense that um, somebody's comfortable in their own skin and comfortable saying what they, what they really think. Uh, I do, I do think that one <coughs> distinction I would draw um, is that there is this sense of like, why don't politicians just always talk like the rest of us all the time? And I do hope that something we take away from the current era is that we, we want politicians who are more careful and cautious with their words 
and their actions than the rest of us would be because they have bigger responsibilities than the rest of us do. So I think there is, I've sort of come down somewhere in the middle of that, that I have some respect for politicians who understand that part of their job is to perform and there's something inherently artificial about performance, but also are able to uh, play themselves rather than playing somebody else. If that makes sense. And in coming down in the middle, you've sh you show that you've also learned some of the lessons of politics, right? <laughs> right come down on both sides of yeah, the Yeah, that's, that's right. Every, yeah, everyone can agree with that. Please buy a book. <laughs> okay, there you go. Hi, um, I'm Michael Burke. I'm a first year in the college. And you touched on this a little bit, but what do you think is the uh, sort of role or duty of comedy in this political climate? And um, a second part, what do you think, um, or how do you think impressions of you know characters like Trump or Sean Spicer serve to humanize or normalize dangerous situations and what do you think is the effect of that? Um, so I think that the the role that comedy can play right now I think is twofold. So one is sanity. Um, you know there's crazy unprecedented stuff happening all the time, most of it bad. And I think we're gonna get through it, but one of the ways we're gonna get through it is by taking a moment to just laugh a little bit, um, because I think you need to, otherwise I don't know how we're gonna, you know, we've lived through however many years in the last nine months and it, there's a lot more to go. Um, I think the other role that comedy can play, that satire can play, is that satire is about looking for truth. And in a White House that talks about alternative facts, I think that satire, that, that truth seeking becomes an act of, I guess we would now call it an act of resistance. Um, it becomes a sort of, uh, um, challenge to the powerful uh, in a way that we wouldn't otherwise have, you know, in a way it shouldn't have to be. Um, then, then really quickly with impressions, I, I think, I mean, I don't know, I like SNL's impressions, th these recently as much as anybody. Generally, more broadly, I think there's a challenge. Um, some of the things happening are ridiculous, but they're also dangerous, and you have to be able to recognize both of those things. You, there is a danger in just saying this is silly. Um, as opposed to this is silly, but also this, this is our lives now and it, it really does matter to people. Thank you. How'd you react to Spicer at the Emmy Awards? Not great. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't like the decision to bring Spicer uh, on, on the Emmy because I didn't think he was, to me he wasn't being self-deprecating, he wasn't apologizing for doing something wrong. He was sort of reveling in the fact that he got away with doing something wrong and that he was now a celebrity for it. Um, so I think there's a distinction. I don't think there's, there's a world in which if Sean Spicer said what I did was wrong, what the White House is doing is still wrong, and, and it, you know, we should be telling the truth to the American people regardless of what we believe, there's a way that comedy could be part of that kind of pivot. But that's not the pivot he made. He made a pivot from being a sort of press secretary who let people down because he didn't do his job with integrity to being a wannabe celebrity. That's not a, that's not a pivot. I don't know. I was not happy about that. Hi, uh, my name is Yang, a uh, graduate student in sociology. Uh, from what I can get from reading Obama's memoir, Dreams from My Father, a likely candidate for inspiring his humorous element might be his uh, maternal grandfather, uh, Stanley Dunham, uh, being a wild card, very forgiving, and um, writing poetry. So from your experience working with Obama on jokes, who might have played a bigger role? What, uh, how has Obama's sense of humor and his approach to using humor been shaped by his families? Oh, uh, you know, I have no idea. <laughs> Just because I feel like I entered, you know, it's interesting, like um, different people, of course, in the administration entered the world of Barack Obama at different times. So, you know, I started off working for Valerie, who has known the Obamas forever. Um, you know, obviously, when you, met Barack Obama. He was a very different Barack Obama than when I discovered Barack Obama. So it was, uh, but for me, because I was sort of late to the game in that sense, um, I think by that point, one of the interesting things was that he had a very clear uh, and consistent vision for the country on the serious speeches and also a pretty consistent sense of humor for the humorous speeches. So I'm not really sure. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I can't help you more. Um, <laughs> Okay, it says last question, but there's two of you, so if you want to try. No, no. Oh, oh you're, you're, just, you're just, oh, perfect. She, she's okay. making sure that nobody sneaks you're, you're in. You're the guardian to, of the question. To, okay, to, well, this to, works out to, great. To, yeah. Hi, I'm Deb. I'm a first year in the college, and uh, I was wondering, what was one thing that you took from Yale or learned or did that uh, really shaped or informed your career? 
You're not uh, rethinking your choice, are you? <laughs> <laughs> So this might not be the answer, uh, especially if there's any faculty here that they want. But uh, I, when I was at college, I was not a good academic at all. Uh, I got very good at reading one chapter of a book and pretending that I understood the whole chapter. And that turned out to be very good practice for speech writing. Um, and I guess what I took away from that uh, is learning that I'm a generalist and not a specialist. So I think one of the one of the things that, I don't know, as you kind of go through, uh, like I remember when I was a freshman in college, I remember being told you have to take a class in something you don't think is interesting at all. So I took a class on like potatoes. <laughs> it was not interesting at all. I apologize if there are potato majors here, but it just wasn't for me. And so I do think that the, some of it is exploring and figuring out what all the things you could do, but then also some of it is, is asking yourself really deeply, what is it that I like to do? What am I good at? And more importantly, like, what am, you know, if you're here, you're a, you're a smart, capable person. There's a lot you can do. Um, but what, you know, there, what are the things that really are, that you can do that no one else can do? And starting to ask yourself, you know, I'm not necessarily early in a college career, but at some point, knowing the answer to that question and knowing what you're less good at um, can be really helpful in figuring out what you ought to be doing. I want to, we have a couple minutes left. I wanted to ask you one of the quotes that I really loved because it resonated so, uh, so strongly with me was uh, that uh, uh, speechwriters are personal trainers. They can help you present the most attractive version of yourself to the public, but they can't turn you into some, someone you're not. I guess this goes to the authenticity piece before, but it also puts pressure on the speechwriter to, uh, to really dig and find the authentic person who they're writing for. How does one do that? Well, I think there, there's two ways to sort of figure out who that person is. I, I spoke about this a little bit, but for us, we were a little bit fortunate where um, either by talking to Favreau or Cody, somebody who spent a lot of time personally with the president, you don't need to go into the office and say, you know, Mr. President, I'm going to write a joke about yogurt. Do you like yogurt? Um, you get a sense of, of who this person is. Uh, and the other thing is um, the, and looking at things online, uh, it, it, writing speeches for someone for the first time, which I still do occasionally, uh, it, there really is no substitute for getting to sit down with someone and talk to them. And, and not just talk to them about what goes in the speech, but about kind of ha having someone tell their stories. Because that's, the stories we choose to tell generally are a, a better way of signaling what's important to us than answering the question, what's important to you? Um, you, know, you? You end up figuring out how to divine those things rather than ask directly. And, um, and the other thing, I mean, I think certainly for President Obama, I remember, I think this was an email that, that we got from you or that someone forwarded us from you, something like that. But the idea of always going back to uh, dreams from my father to some extent, and certainly to the 2004 convention speech as a touchstone. So thinking about um, what are the kind of, what are the touchstones? You know, obviously that won't necessarily be a world famous speech for most people, but it might be, you know, um, uh, for when I wrote for Valerie, for example, um, I would often work in elements of the story she would tell about herself during con her convention speech, uh, not convention speeches, commencement speeches. Um, even if it wasn't a commencement speech, because I knew that that story was a place that was felt like um, it resonated with her. It brought up the themes that brought her to public service. And so thinking about what are those kind of founding documents that you can always go back to and then branch out from. Well, my experience uh, in the White House, uh, the, the, the best hour of my day was uh, I sort of was in charge of the speechwriter unit, the wordsmiths. Uh, when uh, I was there, and uh, almost all of them were under 30, and probably had a truer sense of the essence of Barack Obama than anybody else, and was, were also hilarious. And those were the best, when I look back, those were the consistently the best times I had uh, in the White House. I, we sort of, cr we missed each other. Uh, during that period, but you were very much in the tradition of uh, those who came before you and served with you and left. Um, so uh, I, uh, I appreciate you, and I appreciate this book, uh, and you guys will too when you line up there and buy it. 
And uh, David's good enough to stay and sign the book uh, for you. But I highly recommend it. It really does give you uh, a sense of what the experience is like to be a young campaign warrior, to, to, to be a young aide in the White House, and to experience some of these big events that we see from a distance uh, right at, at, at ground zero. So um, very, very great job. Thank you so much. Thank you.